Hi everyone and welcome to the fourth and final episode of Advocacy Passion and Beyond Voices from the SI Leader Lab a podcast brought to you by Feminism in India in collaboration with the Swedish Institute I'm your host Japreen Pasricha and today we are talking about changing minds and changing systems and as usual I have two guests from the Swedish Institute alumni first let me introduce Sara El Outa from Lebanon Sara is a feminist, civil activist and human rights defender from Lebanon, currently working as a gender and inclusion technical advisor at ASMAE and used to work as project coordinator at Plan International Lebanon for the She Leads program. She was also recently elected as a board member of the Lebanese Women uh, Democratic Gathering. Hi Sara, how are you and how are you feeling today? Hello, hi, how are you? I'm great. Feeling positive. and i just also want to add a little bit uh for our listeners that sara and i are actually batchmates from the same uh program at the spirit institute we were uh we were in the sa leader lab program in 2019 so it's really really great uh sara to see you again here after almost 3 years <laughs> and um moving on to our second guest we have ahmed ben nechma from tunisia Emma is a Tunisian civil society expert who worked with national and international NGOs on different topics during the last 10 years since the Tunisian revolution in 2011 which resulted in the ouster of the dictation, dictatorship regime Emma joined different organizations and managed projects related to election observations decentralization local governance and employment and entrepreneurship of youth and women And today Emma is currently working as the program manager with Oxfam in Tunisia uh, for economic justice program which aims to provide an enabling environment to access to enhanced economic opportunities for youth and women in Tunisia and the MENA region. Hi and welcome Emma. How are you feeling today? Hello. Thank you for the invitation and uh, hello also to to my colleague Sara from the SI uh, program uh, alumni switch institute. And I guess I feel I'm feeling a little bit hot since it's around 40 degree here in Tunisia. So yeah, but excited also about the podcast. Yeah, it's it's the same here in India in Delhi. It's supposed to be monsoon and be raining constantly, but it's so hot. So I can feel you, Ahmed. And uh, with that, Ahmed, I, I would actually like to uh, begin with you, and I would love if you uh, tell us a little more about. your um your experience especially during the tunisian revolution and you know what what role did you play in that in overthrowing the dictatorship um i think it's it's a, it's this this kind of question specifically we can't really uh have an answer uh, beginning with uh, with i like everybody uh, took part in the, in this movement uh everybody went outside everybody like uh, worked together um civil society citizens organization and so on uh to 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 make our voice heard and that's what happened at least at that moment uh there are a lot of changes that happened after a while but uh, that specific moment is like uh, stayed historic because of the the gathering of the all the people so it's not really a matter of one person who contributed with specific thing it's like the the the, the movement the 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 collective the the group i think that's that's the most important part and i think that's one of the most important part also that we'll be focusing on in this podcast uh, related to campaigning because it's not about only one person taking the lead on making a campaigning but it's like collective movement and uh, i think also it's is the same that sara can also testimony about what happened in lebanon also quite few years and months ago yeah actually i agree with ahmad sorry jacqueline i agree because uh, in lebanon we experienced not the same thing but something that is similar to what happened in tunisia which is the 2019 lebanese revolution where we felt like everyone is down there on the streets demanding for several causes but there is one big cause that combines us which is uh, asking to for a good reformation of the country and uh, it feels like campaigning was there in its peak and we were part of it as activists Thank you, Emma and Sara. That uh, I Sara actually remember when that was happening because you and uh, the other participants from Lebanon, we were all 
uh, in Stockholm at that time in 2019, and we were here. We were watching the news, and all of us were so scared for you and our other colleagues because you had your flight back in just a few days, and I can't even imagine uh, what you had to go through. Uh, you know, reaching back to your family, to your daughter, but. um i'm so you know glad that we are here today to talk about it and sara i would like to um you i you also mentioned that you work you were uh, the advocacy coordinator for the not before 18 campaign so could you tell us a little more about what this campaign was about and you know how was your, your experience working on that campaign Yeah, I was the coordinator, and now I'm the supervisor of the campaign as part of RDF Al's mission. Uh, this campaign aims to end child marriage in Lebanon by asking to endorse a law that sets the minimum age of marriage as 18, because in Lebanon we don't have a civil law that specify uh, the minimum age of marriage. Uh, and which is making it impossible for us uh, to stop child marriage in Lebanon. and uh, through years we, we started the campaign in 2017 and until date we're still facing a lot of complications uh, in the system, working with the system in order to end child marriage so the the campaign is still going but of course we change our tactics and methodologies accordingly to according to the context in the in the country Thank you, Sarah. And what would you say? You know, have been as you said, the campaign was launched in two thousand seventeen, and it is still an ongoing campaign. What you what would you say are uh, you know some of your learnings that you would like to share with us and our listeners? Yes. Well, uh, in a context that is Lebanon, we we have a lot of political instability, and we have. currently a socio-economic crisis ongoing so one of the most important learning is that we have to keep a close eye on analyzing the context itself and how the power dynamics are changing especially in the Lebanese parliament and keeping this close eyes helps us to identify who are uh, our main targets to log to lobby uh against and ask them for for this kind of change because in Lebanon every few months we have a different government and we have like uh, changes in the stand towards this cause from the political parties uh however um, this is the main learning but it doesn't say that we we didn't achieve something because of that we w- we were able to build on small successes and keep on going with this campaign Yes definitely I also don't believe that campaigns must have a tangible output immediately because we know that social reform takes decades even centuries and uh, with the recent uh, you know uh, judgment uh, in the US where they reversed Roe versus Wade uh, and abortion has again become uh, restricted in the US um, it is really important for uh, civil society defenders and activists to keep on uh, to keep the campaign alive because we never know where when regressive forces you know come back and um, speaking of the US uh, Ahmed you have worked both in Tunisia and US on different kinds of campaigns could you tell us a little more about uh, what you were doing there and what what kind of different experience uh, you have seen uh you know strategies that people use um uh, and the differences between your work here and uh, in the US yes actually my experience was uh, uh short in the US at a couple of months where i joined uh, an organization called Vermont Worker Center uh we worked on environmental and humanitarian uh, rights uh and i was uh as uh, assistant in the committee that works on advocacy and campaigning and i joined uh the campaigns uh related to environmental issues specifically um i i think uh the the common challenges are 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 the same is uh, uh, whenever you campaign uh, about the cause there is like also the 
politics behind. So not just it, it's not only about uh, economic issues or, or social issues, environmental issues, but politics also. That also takes a, a huge impact on on the cause or the idea that you are uh, advocating for. Uh, so the political positioning is very important uh, because it really influences the the whole cause and the whole orientation, especially if it's related to elections or close to elections, uh, the campaign dating and so on. But I think what what I find what I found interestingly different uh, between US and, and Tunisia is the contribution of the citizens and community in general. Because what happened in, in the US, I found out that people like the community, the local community, contribute to the work of the campaigning. And when I say contribute, I mean even financially, which is like the most important part. And I know that people would say like usually advocacy does not really need a lot of money. But as an organization to, to organize and to campaign for, as you said, Chaplin, it takes like long time, months, years and so on. That demands human resource and demands other resources, including financial resources. So the thing is, like I found that the, the at, at international level, specifically in, in those countries like the US, the community contribute to that directly and financially specifically, which is not the case for us in Tunisia. Um, if you do campaigning, it's very hard to collect money from the community itself, even if they are the community that you are advocating for, for their rights and on, on their behalf. Uh, it, it's not a culture and, and this is, it's not about, about willing to give or not, it's a cultural thing. So campaigning is like more grassroots and more um, uh, related to, to, to the, it's not related to, but the effort contributed by the community, I think uh, I see it much more concrete. I saw it much more concretely in the US rather than in Tunisia. Here we work a lot on different aspects or different methodologies to collect, for example, funds, not from the community itself, but we seek the community help in other things like uh, volunteering or helping on a specific activity or ad hoc action. But um, this is like one of the most interesting differences I saw, for instance. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Emma. I actually didn't realize that uh, fund, like that the difference would lie, one of the biggest difference would lie in fundraising. And that's, that's a very interesting observation. So I would like to actually know more about, um, or if you could share, you know, uh, best practices or your learnings on, if you know one of our listeners today wants to start a campaign uh, how should they go about uh, fundraising for that campaign well fundraising actually it depends because it's like um, a totally i mean a total acts to, to work on and i think before funding there is the most important part is the relevance of the cause to the people that you are going to fund money from because if it's not relevant for them, they will not find you anyway. If it's the cause, even if it's the cause, good and and really working for for their benefits. Um, and, and for that, I think it's it's very important to work on three main axes. Uh, if we are talking about campaigning and advocacy, um, because we are making campaign and advocacy to make change on specific level, and that change, I think, it needs to be based on three main levels. So there is the level. Um, uh, of the community level uh, so we, here we are talking about the culture the ideas the education uh, so so about the social aspect of the campaigning the second one is the legal system because also it's very important to have that legal uh, support for your cause so uh, to help you in, in, in your campaign so to uh, also to, to target the legal thing and at the same time, the, the third one, and here, like in Tunisia, we have the best example of that, maybe the institutional and practices level. And because even if you have the law, sometimes people don't align with that law. And there is no encouragement for people to abide by the law or to respect the law. Uh, at the, so we have different examples in Tunisia here when we have the best laws in we have some laws that are described as the best law in the, uh, in, the in the world in specific thematic area but they are not applied 
and that's the most important part. So it's uh, something that we um, we can uh, talk about. Uh, it's about the practices, the institutional practices, how to make people also follow on the culture and the, the institutional change. Thank you, Ahmed. I completely agree. Uh, you know, we have a similar situation in India where we have a lot of, I would say, if not perfect, but good laws uh, on paper. Uh, but the implementation is quite poor. Uh, and, you know, in India, currently, the topic of abortion is quite uh, in news, uh, not just because of uh, the judgment in the US, but also because uh, when that judgment came out, a lot of Indians were rejoicing, saying, oh, you know, look at the US, we have better laws because in India, abortion is legal uh, for women, uh, you know, across uh, regions and age and marital status. But just now we have have a case where an unmarried woman uh, is uh, almost 24 weeks pregnant and she needs an abortion. But the court, the Delhi High Court has denied it. Even though the law says that she can get an abortion at 24 weeks, the Delhi High Court has denied it, saying because she's unmarried, she can't get an abortion beyond 20 weeks. And it's just, it doesn't make any sense because the law literally says that any woman, regardless of marital status, can get an abortion till 24 weeks and in special cases, even beyond that. And she's very clear that she doesn't want. And the court is saying things like, Oh, why don't you, you know, carry the pregnancy to term and then you can give the child up for adoption. And just ignoring the the mental aspect of, you know, the, the torture that that woman will have to face. And on that note, uh, Sarah, I would like to, uh, uh, I know that you also participated in the Swedish Institute's advocacy lab recently. So I would love to know uh, how was that uh, experience for you and um, what did you learn there, which we didn't, uh, you know, at, uh, in, our, uh, in our Leader Lab program. So if you could tell us a little more about uh, that program. Uh, when we started our campaign, the not before eating campaign, we, we've done a number of uh, evidence-based advocacy steps. Uh, where we, we lobbied in order to prove that uh, scientifically our cause is valid because the scientific aspect uh, was not there uh, in the previous child marriage uh, campaigns in Lebanon. So when we took this lab, uh, I was focusing on this point whole, the whole time. And one of the team members of the Swedish Institute was telling me, Sarah, you have to first to test your uh, theory on ground to a group of people that are uh, suffering from this issue. And then you say if it's going, if your approach is working or not. And I, at first I disregard this thought and just uh, moved and with, with the initial idea that I was putting in place. And um, we've done a tactic and it didn't work. And then we came back to one of the sessions and I shared the experience that we, the tactic didn't work, although it's evidence-based and so on. So uh, the team uh, already prepared some tools in order to test uh, the context and the, do like kind of prototype to our campaign uh, to this number of uh, group and asked us to go to the resource hub and just get the tools and apply it back then. And then when we did it, um, we had we had known the reaction of uh, of the people towards our idea, and we had other thoughts that is different to the perspective that we were doing. Then people, instead of like listening to the scientific uh, negative results of child marriage, they were not interested to know about it. They were more interested in. Uh, about talking about their very specific daily suffering at home. Like when a kid gets married uh, to a very old man, um, how she she was deprived from her peers and she has no more friends and she wanted only to talk about this specific issue. And then after doing this prototype, uh, we, we said, let's 
change the whole context of the campaign and talk about the daily suffering of these girls and launch the campaign and let's see if it's going to work or not. So this is what we did. And uh, uh, surprisingly, we had a lot of uh, public debate on the issue. Uh, And it's also related because it was the COVID period uh, where we were uh, in a lockdown and so on. So people were uh, relating to the uh, video content that we already launched in our campaign that, yes, we are suffering too, although we are not survivors of child marriage. What if we are kids and we get married? We will suffer double and triple. So we started having a lot of public debate on that. And uh, we reached a lot of people. Then we had to tag a lot of parliament members, show them the people what people are saying and so on. And we had to use real testim- testimonials instead of rigid scientific evidence-based information uh, because this is what the society wants. And honestly, I had this learning from the... A recent uh, course that the Swedish Institute done on advocacy because um, my mind was working on like rules one to three uh, ABC of advocacy and then uh, when it comes to testing uh, it was something different so the testing part and having this external eye from a team that is not related to the Lebanese context helped me a lot to shift and change the perspective that we are using in order to achieve more impact from our campaign. Thanks for sharing that, Sarah. And thanks for also bringing up COVID because that's what I wanted to ask you about next. Um, and this is a question to both of you. I would like to know, Uh, How has the pandemic changed the way that you uh, have campaigned? Because, uh, you know, from my experience in India, a lot of uh, grassroots organizations, especially who did not have uh, digital programs or were not online, uh, because of the pandemic, they were forced to come online uh, with limited resources and also, you know, not having the appropriate know-how on digital campaigning and digital advocacy. And uh, many uh, uh, organizations did, uh, you know, uh, suffer because of it, because they neither had the financial resources nor the human resources. Uh, so it has been, uh, and also uh, we we also had, you know, uh, offline protests which had to uh, then you know uh, be like which had to then uh, be converted into online protests and people had to uh, leave the protest site uh, because of the pandemic so i would like to know uh, how did pandemic affect your countries your regions and the way that you campaign uh, allow me to go first i'll give an example on the pandemic that is not related to the not before 18, but related to the whole revolution and the uh, advocacy groups that were uh, on ground in front of the governmental palace asking for certain demands for positive change and so on. So this happened right before the COVID part and then the lockdown came and uh, the government used the pandemic and the lockdown situation in order to tell all protesters that you are not allowed to set your tents. So when when a government used this way, uh, activists, political, especially political as, uh, activists, started inventing and creating social media platforms, and uh, they did like revolution guide and something really, really creative stuff on social media in order to keep people updated with everything that is happening related to corruption, political corruption, and so on. Um, so it was positive at some point. But an, another point, like after now the pandemic, when we when we call for a sit-in or a march or something, people don't go to the streets like before because they are used to electronic march 
or electronic uh, uh, objections. They they stopped getting to the offline life of objecting towards policies uh, and discrimination and so on. So it's re- it really has a double face. But um, one good thing that um, organizations in Lebanon felt during the pandemic, especially those working on protection issues like CP and GBV and so on, um, accelerated their advocacy, online advocacy work more in order to reach people sitting at home, especially women and children who are uh, exposed to abuse. However, on the other side, um, we we have it has badly impacted our activism on ground because we were at home for almost one year and a half or even more, if I'm not mistaken. Well, thank you, Sarah. You you said almost uh, most of it actually. I think, uh, as as Sarah mentioned, uh, the good thing is uh, about what happened in the pandemic is like it showed us a new ways of campaigning, specifically using digital means and online. But the thing is the struggle of, of converting that that campaigning outputs then on, on the field and to real activist activities uh, offline. Uh, so th- that conversion actually is, is kind of a challenge to do. And uh, I also, I think one of the second point that is very important, at least from our experience uh, related to the campaigning online is um, that showed us that the myth that we had about youth and women and the community in general that are connected and very well connected and they are online and so on is not really that true because there are a lot of communities that are vulnerable and marginalized and they don't have access to these tools. And so we found out that campaigning online is exclusive a little bit because it excludes some of the communities that don't have access to these tools or they have access to to these tools, but they don't know how to use it. And so um, I I know that COVID-19 pushed everything to be like digital and online and everybody was talking about that. But for us, at least uh, from from my perspective in the project that we worked on with Oxfam, we tried also to be as inclusive as possible uh, for the people who really don't use uh, technological and digital tools. So this is also something very important that we uh, we learned. But also, the good thing is like um, we we learned that there are a lot of things that can be digitalized also, which simplifies uh, the life of the people who work uh, on these campaignings, and and make it useful and easier and less expensive uh, for campaigning actually for specific things or specific activities. And also, it gives you the opportunity to be. Uh, in link with other people from around because I think also the, the impact of digitaliz- digitalization and using uh, online tools is to push people also to be uh, to, to, to take part in webinars that they didn't know before to take part in online activities and this opened us to be more connected to people from international community. So we participate in more webinars with other people that we don't know. So we learn a lot from them. And I think if, if it's not about COVID, we wouldn't think about joining those webinars or, or online or because they exist even before, but we didn't really have the opportunity to, to join them. But due to the pandemic and being obliged to stay online and behind the laptop, you find yourself like, oh, this is a good webinar. Why not join in them? And that really helped also the international community to work together. So I think that there are a lot of um, advantages and uh, drawbacks at the same time from the uh, what happened in the COVID related to campaigning and advocacy. Uh, I would like to add something that uh, Ahmed just said, uh, which is uh, recently in the Arab countries, since Ahmed and I are Arab, uh, in the Arab countries we witnessed uh, a number of domestic uh, murders uh, under what's so called the honor crimes and less like more than 18 murders in less than one month in different regions uh, in the Arab countries and this has pushed all feminist activists to ask for uh, 6th of July 
which is which was a few days ago uh, for an يعني, online protest and this online protest states that women uh, are unified and will stop working on 6th of July and all of a sudden we we saw that uh, In parallel, uh, one of the countries that uh, had uh, this domestic uh, crime, uh, which is Egypt, has announced a statement uh, against the killer and which made other countries like Lebanon and other countries move and uh, other countries government, I mean, move and uh, try to give statements on the murders that are ha- happening in, in the country itself. Um, this is to say that what Ahmed is saying is really important that after the lockdown and after being online all the time, we start feeling like um, we are no more like uh, separate countries. We are one region region living a uh, almost very common context and we have to respond to what is happening to to our neighboring countries or to the countries in our region and when we respond we're doing a, a, a a higher level of campaigning and we're showing a higher level of solidarity towards uh, some issues and this is helping people from vulnerable groups to speak up for example when when we heard about what happened to uh, the girl in Egypt many girls in other countries started speaking about about, uh, about the threats they are receiving from men or from some of their families and so on about uh, going to be killed and so on. So I think this is one of the very positive things that happened after COVID, which is the collective solidarity and encouragement to speak up against abuse. And uh, um, but but the, the the magic is you can you can never know how it starts and it triggers the whole flame, you know. Uh, when it starts it, it it leaves an impact. But for example, a lot of things were shared but they didn't leave an impact so it's really um, there's like um, a mysterious factor behind it thank you for sharing that sara uh, it's it's so ironic that that such a you know gut wrenching tragedy has to take place for this kind of collective solidarity um, uh, in the region and uh, i just would i just want to share that domestic violence and honor killings also happen in my country in india and it's just a uh, really really uh, sad that in this day and age we are uh, murdering women in the name of honor um, i i have no words i don't know what to say here um but in the uh, in the because we don't have much time and i know that we are just close towards the our end i would like to move on to uh, we just have two more questions left um so one um uh, sara i would like to ask you if you have used uh, storytelling as a strategy uh during campaigning and if it has been successful if you could share um any one two examples with us yes um uh, storytelling uh, is one of the most important tools we we would ever use not only in campaigning and everything but recently in our recent campaign um that le- left an impact here uh, under the not before 18 campaign was based on the storytelling part Uh, and as i mentioned before uh, it included testimonials and these testimonials uh, spoke their stories but we transform it into a creative audiovisual content so the power of the story uh, is what reached people and what people can now remember from the whole campaign um, so i think that storytelling was is and was and will always be one of the most important element of any campaign in order to for the campaign to succeed yeah yeah I, even here in india uh, and some of the campaigns that i have been part of uh, i do believe storytelling and especially 
uh, talking about individuals as people and not as a statistic is really important uh to you know evoke that emotion in others to either for fundraising or for you know joining together in solidarity um but as we mentioned earlier also campaigning is uh, especially campaigning towards uh, system changing is a very tedious job and it it will not have a tangible output you know at the end of the campaign we don't even know when is the end of the campaign so uh, ahmed I, i would like to ask you if you could share um you know any tips for our listeners uh, today um you know when we experience roadblocks in our campaigning journey uh, what what keeps you motivated or how to motiv- how to keep ourselves motivated uh, even though we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel how do you keep faith in in the cause you work in i think the first of all you must believe in the cause you work on and that this is something that is very important because um, unfortunately this is something i see in the civil society and i have my personal point of view in this is like um if if you work on the civil society you should believe on what you are working on you just don't work for salary or for functions so you work for the cause and if you have so if, so if you have some people who are like affected on a campaign but they are doing the campaign just as a job not as like you know a belief Uh, it's very hard to convince these people to, to to continue and carry on the, the the cause. So the first thing is like believing in the cause yourself. Actually, you need to believe in the thing that you are advocating for. Um, uh, the second thing is, I think it's it's very important to be flexible, uh, specifically in these times. I mean, uh, the COVID uh, happened like uh, changed everything. Even though people were very creative, very flexible, like. just overnight people started to create online tools and to to manage with the new tools and new new activities new campaigning things and it, it was very inspiring at some point uh after the covid uh especially if we talk for us in if we take the example of the arabic world it's very 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 challenging very very uh changing also um in tunisia we have had like i don't know around 11 governments in just 10 years So, like advocating is quite. It was really, really challenging. Like every year you have a new minister. So, uh, it it wasn't really easy. But the, as as I told you, like the post, the 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 insight is about being flexible. So for us, for instance, if we don't find like the same people who were advocating for the ministry, we shifted our advocacy plan to advocate towards the administrative people who are influencers. Because those administrative people, they don't change actually with ministries. They stay there, and they are very close to the decision makers. So we thought about uh, why not changing actually our our idea and going to the uh, those administrative people. I think we tend usually to advocate for like very complex and big topics, uh, and instead of like the fragmentation, let's say. of this topic in small topics and we work on advocating on those small topics step by step and the gathering of the outcomes of these all topics will give us the the results that we seek for so th- this is what, one of the things that really uh, challenge also people that uh, make them stuck because they 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 see the big picture uh, and they see also the big problems they see it like very complex and very complicated and it takes it includes a lot of stakeholders at the same time so it becomes huge and it becomes a burden actually to 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 follow up and i think the problem in here is we don't want to tackle the problem uh, with sub problems first we just want to or solve the problem in as an overall mission you know not really taking a step by step and i think that's one of the most important thing we can just make it smaller basically set smaller goals for yourself instead of just saying i'm going to end gender inequality today because as much as all of us would like to do that we know that that's not going to happen and none of us can do it individually or even as a collective we know that that's not going to happen in our lifetimes unfortunately 
but we all are working towards that goal in some way or the other um perfectly said eman and i know that we are running out of time but i have one last question for both of you and it's a it's a fun question so uh, we are asking uh, since this podcast is about the swedish institute alumni we are asking everybody this as our wrap up question uh if you could answer in you know really uh, really quick answer on um when you were doing your program at the swedish institute what was that one moment or a aha moment that you know clicked something for you or changed the way you uh, see things today or you know uh, like gave you a different perspective um so and you were there <laughs> so you know what i'm going to share it um we had to do the storytelling part and uh, we were uh, uh, set in small groups and we have done it in small groups and then uh, the group chose name nominated me to to share it in front of everyone and i shared uh, the story of myself why i'm advocated for advocating for child marriage and when i finished my story uh, i saw the whole uh, room clapping and <laughs> screaming my name that uh, <laughs> that yes they were encouraging me and they were happy that of my reaction in my story and how i faced the child ma- risk of being a child uh, uh, married back then so when i i uh, walked towards my colleagues Uh, back then i remember that i had more than 20 hugs and kisses <laughs> and this was the most yeah, compassionate moment of my life after giving birth to my daughter of course <laughs> but it was the most uh, amazing one that i can still remember until today and from that moment until today i feel not ashamed a bit to share any hard or negative story about myself that i faced even if it's related to sexual assault and very sensitive stuff instead i feel proud to share it especially in front of people who who don't speak up usually i feel like i have to do it it's one of my things that i have to do in order to empower others to also speak up because i was empowered in switch institute back then and i love uh, the network honestly and yeah yani, the network is still so dear to me because of that moment yeah i i remember that day clearly and i know i remember that the entire room was crying everybody was crying listening to your story uh, it was so heart touching i i i, I can still uh, i can still visualize you standing in front of 50 participants talking about your experience uh, thank you so much for sharing that sara ahmed over to you now well Sarah, you made me feel jealous about not attending that moment. <laughs> But um, yeah, it, it was it was really one of the best experiences uh, for me. Um, uh, I think I think I follow up on on what Sarah said. Um, um, it's not about sharing my experience personally. It's it's about the whole program itself, and specifically also like the the, the mentors and facilitators who are. Uh, following us on on this uh, journey on the, on the program um i think what i learned specifically uh, or, um, besides the tools and uh, the technical things that we learned but how they as a team uh created the safe space for people like us like sara to be open uh so much specifically for people they didn't meet before like for the first time and it's it's the same thing what happened with me also in the group like there are people who, who even um, shared its stories that they shared for the first time in their life with anybody and i think uh, that's one of the most important lessons learned for me is like how this team created that safe space and let people really be uh, very comfortable to share very personal sensitive things very vulnerable points about their personal life their professional life and so on 
And I think this is uh, very important uh, and very challenging to create, actually. I think it's, it's very important to know how the, to acquire that knowledge of to, how to make people feeling safe with you so they can really share and open up with you. I agree so much with you, Emma. It's so important for us as activists, as civil society defenders, as campaigners to be vulnerable because we are fighting all the time. We are fighting the system and we are swimming against the tide and we have to be strong and thick skinned. But at times uh, we forget uh, that we also have to be vulnerable and it is difficult to be vulnerable to talk about your deepest fears and feelings in uh, in front of a group of people that you don't know uh, so well uh, so I, I i know that because i also shared when uh, when sarah and i were there i also shared my story of sexual assault uh, with our batch group and it's just so cathartic uh, to share that with everyone uh, so thank you, uh, both of you, um, once again for being here. And on, on that note, I officially uh, would like to um, uh, close this episode and also thank our listeners for being here with us uh, till now. I hope that we get to see you again. Uh, but do keep, uh, uh, do subscribe to us and uh, on your streaming, uh, on your favorite streaming platform. And um yeah, and stay tuned. Uh, thank you so much, everyone.